Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to JICA webinar. Uh, welcome to JICA COVID webinar series. Uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Akiko Ito of JICA. This webinar is hosted by JICA here in Tokyo, Japan. JICA COVID-19 webinar series bring together various leading health professionals from Japan and elsewhere to share their knowledge and experience on COVID-19 response and uh, discuss the implications of their work. We're gonna have the eighth webinar today. In this event, we focus on the innovation trial design to rapidly and efficiently evaluate multiple interventions to optimize the best therapeutics for COVID-19, which is remap cap randomized embedded multifactorial adaptive platform trial for community acquired pneumonia. We invite three guest speakers today from Japan, Nepal, and Pakistan, who are engaged in remap cap trial in their country to discuss common future of adaptive platform trials and shared experience of remap cap operation in their country. Okay, before we start, please allow me to make a quick announcement on the on housekeeping matters. Okay, first, uh, this webinar is being held in English and French. An interpretation function is available on the interpretation button. So please select the language of your choice for you to enjoy the discussion. Second, we have QA session after speaker's presentation. So please do not hesitate to ask questions to the speakers using the QA function during the webinar. So please use QA function for writing questions, not the chat box. Number three, today's webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on the YouTube channel of JICA Ogata Research Institute later. Number four, we have uploaded the speaker's presentation slides in the cloud for your reference. You can find access information in the reminder email we sent one hour ago, or you can also find it in the chat box. Please remind it that reproducing all or any part of its content is prohibited. Number five. After the webinar, you'll be asked to fill out the short survey. This online survey will take about five minutes to complete. The link will be announced at the end of the webinar. So we appreciate your feedback on this event. And finally, we are preparing the next webinar in November and we'll open the information website soon. We'll announce you as soon as we are ready. Okay, so again, I would like to welcome all of you to JICA COVID-19 COVID webinar series. So to open up the webinar, I would like to invite Mr. Takizawa, the Senior Director of Office for COVID-19 Response at JICA for his official welcome and the introduction of our speakers. Mr. Takizawa, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening and good afternoon or good morning wherever you are. And welcome to our webinar series. Uh, my name is Iko Takizawa. I'm a senior director of the Office for COVID-19 Response of JICA. And here in Japan, we experienced the biggest surge of COVID-19 over the summer, inflicting a huge stress to the health systems and also the lives of the people. But the situation is much better now. And the number of new infections in Tokyo is the lowest uh, in the year. I hope everyone uh, attending this seminar uh, is coping uh, safe and well with the evolving situation. Since we launched JICA's initiative for global health and medicine under the strong leadership of President Kitaoka uh, last summer, we have been mobilizing our organization-wide support to our partners around the three pillars of prevention, precaution, and treatment. 
Our global support since the start of the pandemic includes extension of concessional loan in the form of general budget support to mitigate the macroeconomic and budgetary stress, and also provision of essential materials and technical support to help boost emergency response of our partner institutions to about 70 countries in total. According to a, a recent paper published in, in The Lancet uh, by the GBD 2020 Health Financing Collaborator Group uh, Network, uh, Japan was a top contributor of development assistance for uh, the effort to fight COVID-19 in 2020. And we are really delighted that uh, we were able to take part in the global solidarity to fight the, the pandemic. And we are encouraged to see innovations uh, helping us to fight the disease. Uh, effective vaccines have been approved in record speed. And though there remain challenges in equitable uh, deployment, and also effective therapeutics are coming out and uh, more are in the pipeline. But one of the shortcomings we faced in such uh, accelerated uh, R&D process was the way clinical researches were conducted the researchers, in response to the health emergency, of course, rushed to conduct um, studies to identify the effective therapeutics, often involving uh, repurposed drugs. But many of them had constraints in study design or did not have adequate power to provide clinically meaningful results. And oftentimes we were left wondering whether they were effective or not. Are there a better way of conducting clinical research under the challenge of uncertainty and also unpredictability associated with health emergency? The answer may be uh, the use of adaptive design in clinical research. And today, we will listen to the experts working on the REMAP CAP, uh, one of the global networks promoting the use of adaptive design in clinical researches with a focus on the therapeutics for and, and therapeutic management of community acquired pneumonia. Without further ado, I would like to present today's excellent speakers. First, we have Dr. Hiroki Saito. Uh, he's an associate professor at Department of Emergency and Clinical uh, Critical Care Medicine, St. Mariana University School of Medicine, Japan. He's also a member of International Trial Steering Committee of the REMAP CAP. And also we have Dr. Deptish Ariel. Uh, he's a, ne a national coordinator for Nepal Intensive Care Research Foundation and Nepal ICU Registry. He's also a principal investigator for REMAP CAP trial in Nepal. And we also have Dr. Madiha Hashimi. She's a professor and chairperson at Department of Critical Care Medicine, Ziaudin University, Karachi, Pakistan. She's leading price or Pakistan Registry of Intensive Care. I hope everyone will enjoy today's webinar as much as I do. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Takizawa. So now we begin the speaker's presentation, starting with Dr. Saito. So Dr. Saito, are you ready for your presentation? May I ask you to take the floor? Thank you very much for your introduction, uh, Mr. Takizawa and Ms. Ito. Thank you very much. I think uh, Mr. Takizawa's uh, summary was uh, perfect, so I don't have much to say, but uh, <laughs> I tried to be short so that I, uh, I think I will have uh, two of the other speakers uh, get enough time to talk. So let me share my screen. I hope that now you are seeing my screen. So it is my great pleasure to give a talk today. Uh, my name is Hiroki. Uh, I'm a Japanese physician currently based in Yokohama, Japan. And today, three of us give us a talk from different perspectives on REMAP-CAP. 
and I will mainly focus on the background information on clinical trials as a COVID-19 response, and maybe a little bit of what we do in Japan for remap gap. And historically, even in the 21st century, we are struggling with emerging and re-emerging infections. And even though the scale of COVID-19 pandemic is enormous compared to other outbreaks and epidemics, we know that such epidemic-prone infections occur here and there anytime. And then, what do we mean by COVID-19 response? I know this is a very simple figure, but I summarize what we tend to see as public health versus the medical measures here. At the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of attention might have been paid to lockdown, like a political decision. And now, that's even more than a year and a half since the pandemic, we watch vaccine-related news every day on the media. But how about therapeutic management? Why are we excited to hear about the vaccine development, but not much about therapeutic management? And therapeutic management may include not only R&D, research and development of a new drug, but also optimization of combination therapy of existing drugs. And mentally, we may think we can't do clinical trials during the, uh, during the pandemic because we are busy in other business, but should we accept such mentality as a frontline healthcare workers? So all of us remember what we experienced back in 2014 and 15 for Ebola. Unfortunately, the overall scientific harvest of the therapeutic trials was described as low thing, not what we originally experienced or expected. And then after the experience in Ebola response in West Africa, this report is from the US National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Uh, they formed an ad hoc committee and essentially, as you can see here down the slide, uh, they made uh, multiple recommendations, uh, including the last one, stating randomized trials are the preferable approach, and unless there are compelling reason not to do so, every effort should be made to implement RCTs. So this is a figure to show how many interventional clinical trials uh, are registered for potential COVID-19 drugs uh, globally, and the authors estimate the interventional clinical trials for therapeutic represent only one third of all COVID-19 related trials, including observational studies and vaccine trials, etc. And in and out of roughly three thousand trial arms, the authors estimate around five percent of arms could be considered randomized with adequate power. And a quarter of enrolled patients contribute to such adequately powered RCTs. And now, uh, more and more attention is being paid to adaptive platform trials, APT. I will explain about the APT later. But this is from the WHO Living Guideline on COVID-19 Therapeutic Management. They say uh, there's a need for more effective treatments for COVID-19. Also, they pointed out large and international platform trials, such as recovery, WHO solidarity, remap cap, and active, uh, that recruit large numbers of patients in many countries with a pragmatic adaptive design and they say essentially these uh, platform trials uh, generated have generated uh, lots of evidence uh, for therapeutic management of COVID-19. So what is APT, Adaptive Platform Trial? This article was published by one of the uh, RemapCap ITC, ITSC member back in 2015. 
describing the definition and the characteristics of APTs. APT uh, is defined by the broad goal of finding the best treatment for a disease by simultaneously investigating multiple treatment. Essentially, they said uh, platform trials enabled uh, evaluating uh, efficacy of multiple agents in a heterogeneous population. And it tends to be a long time, a uh, long term. And also, uh, they can handle multiple treatment groups. And also, the trial infrastructure may be supported by multiple uh, federal or industrial sponsors or a, combi a combination. And they even back in 2015, around the Ebola time, there was growing interest in APTs because of the need to rapidly evaluate multiple potential treatment. And also, the, they said the ethical imperative to achieve the best possible outcomes in, in tri trial uh, participants. Uh, prior to COVID-19, APTs were mainly conducted in high-income countries, but they can play a significant role in drive, uh, driving evidence-informed policy-making LMICs. And this article illustrates how APTs can be better utilized to address global health issues, including LMICs. And as you can see uh, here in the figure one, APTs allow for multiple intervention to be evaluated in a perpetual manner, serial manner. And interim analysis is made peri periodically, and each intervention is assessed. And for example, if uh, one of the interventions is considered in failure, then that inf inf intervention may be dropped. On the other hand, if a more promising intervention appears, then it can be added as a new intervention. And APTs can minimize the number of participants allocated to the control group and saving the sample size to answer research questions and as a consequence, saving the cost for research. And also because APTs tend to be large in scale and the long-term co commitment, uh, the authors uh, states that APTs help capacity building and the reinforcement of local infrastructure, even LMICs. And this article summarizes how we responded to COVID-19 from clinical trials perspective and how we can move forward. The authors pointed out there were too many clinical trials with questionable research quality, leading to the research community's response being arguably inefficient and wasteful. And they highlighted the importance of pre-existing resource efficient trial sites and capacity and building up research ecosystem. They emphasized the importance of coordination and collaboration in research communities instead of too many independent clinical trials. Otherwise, many clinical trials could be too small in scale to be conclusive. So in that regard, APTs can facilitate such coordination and collaboration. They referred to uh, solidarity and remap cap and recovery trials in this article. And also uh, uh, they pointed out strengthening the research ecosystem that is resilient and dynamic will enhance our future pandemic response globally. So let me briefly talk about remap cap. Uh, these are the figures describing the current status of remap cap globally. We have enrolled more than 8,000 8, COVID-19 patients from 300 hospitals across 21 countries. And this is the map of remap cap uh, participating sites. So this is very global. Uh, remap cap stands for randomized embedded multifactorial adaptive plot trial for community acquired pneumonia and it was originally started in 2016 targeting cap community acquired pneumonia but they already had a protocol for future pandemic infection in place 
Because of this pandemic responsive nature, Remap Cab had already been endorsed by WHO. And once COVID-19 spread globally last year, they just activated this protocol, so we responded uh, very quickly and efficiently. And we, as Japanese researchers, joined this Remap Cap community uh, in early 2020. And we proposed the slogan, avoid nebneck practice and foster sub -sub practice. And NEVNEG and SEBSEG are acronyms we created this time. We like to transform our clinical practice from neither evidence-based nor evidence-generating to sensibly evidence-based and sustainably evidence-generating. So unfortunately, it was after the COVID-19 pandemic and our response was not as quick as other countries that were already part of this research community. But fortunately, our activities will continue and we strongly believe we will be more resilient in Japan if we are successfully building up appropriate research capacity by the end of, by the next uh, pandemic in the future. So Japan is well known for disaster management because we have lots of natural disasters like earthquakes and resilience is a key word. And this applies to health emergencies like COVID-19 pandemic and the future pandemic uh, infection response. And we hope Japan will be uh, better prepared and also continue to work on this resilience across countries with you for the healthier global society. So this is my end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my talk and then I will hand over to the other two great speakers who will share their experiences on their front line. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saito. So now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Deptish uh, to share the the remap implementation experience in Nepal. Okay, Dr. Tiptish, may I ask you to take the floor? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Diptish. Um, I'm uh, from Nepal, uh, currently working as intensivist and researcher in Kathmandu. And I'm thankful to Zaika and all the participants for giving us this opportunity to share our work uh, with all the <clears throat> uh, participants here and Zaika team. So in next uh, few slides, uh, I'll just <clears throat> share our experience of uh, how we are trying to build a resource capacity in critical care services, ICUs in Nepal, and, and how remap cap implementation has been one of the, uh, uh, like a, one of the um, uh, well um, designed um, method uh, to establish the research capacity and also uh, pave uh, ways for future clinical trials in Nepal. So, so I'll briefly talk about like uh, the challenges and the barriers that we currently face in implementing research projects, especially in low and middle income countries like Nepal. Uh, but I'd also like to highlight why we need to build research capacity in countries like Nepal. And, uh, and also like to talk about uh, critical care Asia and Africa network, uh, which is um, uh, coordinating remap cap in this reason, uh, I'll uh, talk about the organization later on and how, and how it has helped us build research capacity in Nepal. And then a few slides and implementation of Nepal and how and what's the plan for future to further strengthen the research capacity and clinical trials possibilities in Nepal. So if we uh, look at 
the literature or the evidence, then historically, what most of the people have reported is like, uh, there are so many challenges and barriers in implementing health research and work and clinical trials in LMICs. So most of the uh, common, uh, commonly listed um, factors are like there's lack of awareness of uh, research work and clinical trials among healthcare professionals and even the uh, common public and the population in this region. And there's lack of motivation to lead or work on clinical trials. And there's also lack of knowledge and technical skills to undertake trials because trials are something that needs lots of expertise and uh, and lots of um, uh, uh, training and uh, understanding of the implementation part. And um, since the critical care services or the medical services itself are struggling to provide the basic healthcare services, uh, then the, the leadership roles in, in implementing trials or building research capacities has always been, uh, uh, been limited in this part of the world. And besides there are issues with logistics, there are sometimes there are issues with research relevancy and also the implementation issues. And there are um, limited facilities, limited uh, human resources who are trained in research expertise and uh, capacity building. And there are also a limited availability of fund. And one of the major concerns is there is a limited understanding and the, and, and uh, and the public engagement or patient education and support during the for the research activities. So there are so many limitations when we talk about implementing research work in, in our settings. But can we overcome that? Like, uh, can we do something to overcome these limitations and use them for our benefit to implement some of the practice changing research work? So that's what uh, we did. Like um, Nepal Intensive Care Research Foundation uh, is a <laughs> collaborative partner in this welcome Oxford Innovation Flagship Project, uh, which is called Critical Care Asia and Africa. And basically it aims at building research capacity in settings like ours. And one of the major methods that we have implemented is the use of cloud-based um, registry platform. And uh, this is uh, spanning over uh, nine different Asian countries and also a few African countries. And Nepal Intensive Care Research Foundation is one of the collaborators. And we have used this platform to implement Nepal ISU registry. So that was the, um, that's where our journey uh, of, for implementation of trials like Remapcap started. So we started with the implementation of ICU registry. So now currently it's uh, spanning over uh, these many countries. Um, under Critical Care Asia Network. So Nepal Intensive Care Research Foundation, uh, it's a not-for-profit organization. And uh, we have built this foundation with the currently working clinicians, nurses, healthcare workers, other <coughs> policy makers, and have um, some collaboration with uh, Nepal Health Research Council as well. And we, are, uh, we have built a Nepal ICU registry and uh, we aim to scale up this project as a national ICU registry uh, all across Nepal. And basically our aim is to support healthcare teams to build a network of healthcare facilities who work together as a community of practice to improve quality of critical care and also enable high quality multi-center clinical research. And, uh, and that's um, one of the aims and we think it's feasible in settings like ours as well. And uh, to meet this objective, we started with remap cap. So we all know, <clears throat> or Saito has already explained the, the global picture of the trial. And um, uh, we decided to implement remap cap during the COVID, uh, the early days of COVID crisis in Nepal. And we, we planned a stepwise approach for the implementation of remap cap. So Nepal ICU registry, what we did is first we collaborated with Critical Care Asia. We formed uh, a coordination committee. So there's a regional uh, management committee. We are also part of the regional management committee of Critical Care Asia, REMAPCAP. 
Then we identified national PIs who are locally working intensivists and um, uh, physicians. And then we developed local research team who are part of the ICUs, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, uh, other uh, allied healthcare workers. And we quickly did some of uh, the trainings and uh, uh, skill transfer um, uh, steps uh, through remotely, like we used uh, online platforms and uh, support from our uh, regional and global uh, partners to train our staff. And we did it um, uh, uh, in a very short span. And then what we did, uh, the remap cap was embedded within the registry. So the registry was already um, on like um, implemented at a few ICU sites in Kathmandu. And uh, we adopted the registry platform. We embedded um, remap cap within the registry and that made the um, the implementation quite easier because as we all know that where we suffer from limited um, health um, care human resource, having an additional research team uh, wasn't feasible at that time. So we kind of integrated the clinical team and the research team. And uh, that was uh, uh, where they shared their responsibilities and um, they used the platform. Uh, as a part of their usual clinical practice, the registry platform, and uh, it was used for remap as well. And all the regulatory and ethical approval was done through Nepal Health Research Council. And, and that's where we got um, uh, approval for four sites initially. And then later on, one more site was started that is from outside Kathmandu in Chitwan. And we implemented uh, two domains of remap apps. So we tested. Uh, anticoagulation domain and vitamin C domain. So there are different domains within remap cap. And we, these are the hospitals where we implemented uh, those research, uh, the clinical trials, Nepal Medicity, Grandi, Hams, Tiro uh, Truon University Teaching Hospital and later on Chiton Medical College. And until now we have screened uh, more than 2000 patients, COVID patients, and we have enrolled more than 500 patients to remap cap. And that's quite a significant contribution from um, our say, our part of the world. And currently we are also running, uh, we also enroll patients for antiplatelet domain. And we are in the process of getting more domains approved uh, through Nepal Health Research Council. So over last one year, uh, so we have, been able to develop research capacity, uh, like in forms of there. We now have um, researchers, investigators within our network, there are national coordinators, site investigators, research nurses, data collectors, site coordinators. So there we have kind of been able to develop uh, capacity in terms of human resource and also skills and training. And, um, and this is what our ICU registry looks like. So, so where we have an integrated remap cap within the ICU registry. And this registry has helped us um, identify and measure the critical care, uh, you know, like um, process related uh, variables, uh, the quality indicators. And we have been able to identify some of the major problems of ICU within the like our context itself, like for example, hospital acquired infections or, or readmission rate or um, uh, like um, outcomes of intubated patients, sepsis. So this kind of um, studies um, are ongoing. We, are, we have been um, um, clinically auditing our um, uh, like um, ICU registry database and it has helped us build uh, find the uh, find the gaps and build uh, better in interventions, and also plan for future research work. And um, so this is just a process of remap cap where a locally um, organized team did all the screening, consenting, randomization, data entry, validity, um, validation of data, monitoring. All the processes were done from the local research team themselves, and uh, this has helped us build a team. Um, who take the ownership and feel empowered that we are part of the global research work. And we have also identified sustainable methods uh, to 
make the research projects um, feasible, sustainable, and also has used the uh, network for uh, global collaboration. Uh, so uh, I've already mentioned what these things, so the implementation of the registry and the remap cap has helped us build uh, um, the research capacity. And, um, and what's next, like uh, what do we have in plan for future? So we think that uh, with the availability of uh, ICU registry and the way that we have implemented remap cap, uh, we do have now high quality data system to deliver um, evaluate and and also test like improvement methods in healthcare systems in countries like ours, like Nepal and um, and um, and we have also published a paper recently where we compared whether the database that we have prepared are are you are valid and uh, are and and we have measured the quality of the uh, of the of the data variables that we capture so. Um, so we can say that the, the registry that we have implemented in this part of the region is comparable to some of the high income countries and can help us build uh, foundations for implementation of further research projects in Nepal and uh, in this region. And, uh, and we have been able to contribute to generate evidence in a global platform uh, for example, these are some of the publications from Remap, which has um, been practice changing publications, especially in COVID-19 and anticoagulation. So we feel proud that we have been part of this global project. And, um, and uh, with the support of Critical Care Asia and Africa Network, uh, we look forward to collaborating with the global research community and, and represent low and middle income countries in multicentric trials not only just as implementation level, but as um, at planning and uh, coordination committees as well. And Critical Care Asia has given us the platform and, uh, and, and we are proud that we can probably take the co-ownership of the global multicentric research works even uh, in settings like ours where this kind of work was not uh, possible earlier. So uh, the implementation of Remap Cap has been a, a great learning experience for us and has helped us build a uh, foundation for future uh, clinical, critical, uh, clinical trials and research projects in Nepal and the region. Uh, thank you. With that, I would like to uh, stop my presentation here. If there are any, any questions, you can write to me or can uh, ask me here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Diptish, for the wonderful presentation to share uh, your, your experience and Nepal experience with us. Okay, so now I want, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Dr. Mariha um, to share the Pakistan experience on the remap gap operations. Okay, so Dr. Mariha, are you ready for your presentation? Yes, uh, thank okay, you. Okay, so much. take the floor, please. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, you can start so the presentation. Okay, thank you. So hello everyone in all the time zones. Good morning, afternoon, good night. Uh, I'm really very grateful to the JICA team for uh, giving me and Diptesh this opportunity to share our experience of being part of an international clinical trial with our limited resources and uh, during a global pandemic. Okay, Dr. Dr. Mariha, sorry to yes. interrupt you, but can you speak up a little bit, please? Sorry? Can you speak up a little bit, please? Okay, yes. uh, and can you see my screen? Yes, yes, okay, we can. The... Okay, so uh, I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Yes, so that is let me first. Okay, 
So let me first introduce uh, the country that I'm coming from. Uh, Pakistan is a country of more than 220 million people in South Asia. And uh, in the South Asian region, eight countries, they formed a geopolitical uh, union, which is known by the name of SARC which is South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. So eight countries, as you can see on the map, these eight countries, they comprise 3% of the world area, but 21% of the world population. And unfortunately, 90% of the burden of disease uh, lies in this uh, SARC region. So, uh, you can understand that this is a huge uh, region where the burden of different kinds of diseases is. Uh, but unfortunately, when it comes to research output, it is very minimum from this huge region. As Diptesh has uh, previously um, uh, discussed in detail, a uh, few of the reasons why the research output is so low from uh, developing and low middle income countries. So a few of the reasons that I think uh, prevent research from our region is uh, inherent in our culture, as well as uh, we just consider data to be very sacred and secret and we don't like sharing them. There are very few trained people in our countries. And again, brain drain is a big re uh, reason that uh, whoever gets trained leaves the country. Then obviously technological uh, know-how and infrastructure is also very important. But there's another reason why uh, people or clinicians don't engage in research activities is because most of us are always uh, firefighting. Uh, as you can see in this paper, um, when it comes to critical care, the, num the bed capacity in uh, Asia is very limited. It is only 3.6 as compared to 12 ICU beds per 100,000 population in high income countries. And unfortunately, in Pakistan, uh, the number of critical care beds available is, uh, is, is, is the least in, from the region as well. So only 0.7 critical care beds are available uh, to treat uh, critically ill patients. And the number of uh, clinicians who are trained in critical care is even less. So uh, uh, there is only 12% of intensive care units in Pakistan have uh, uh, people who are trained in intensive care. So one intensivist for 82 ICU beds. So those few handful of clinicians who are trained to look after critically ill patients do not find any time to engage in research activities. So we are very lucky that uh, a handful of um, uh, clinicians uh, from South Asia, from Sri Lanka, uh, basically, they attempted uh, to uh, improve the research infrastructure uh, in South Asia. So these two uh, people, they worked on an intensive care registry in Sri Lanka. And uh, later on, it was implemented in Pakistan. And uh, very fortunately, Wellcome Trust is now funding uh, the Crit Care Asia pro project, as Diptesh has earlier uh, told you about. So their work package one basically consists of um, implementing registries in the South Asian uh, region. So as you can see that in South Asia, th there are, I'm really sorry about uh, my slides are not working very properly. So in out of the eight countries in the South Asian uh, region, six countries uh, now have a critical care registry. So you have seen Diptesh uh, tell you about the registry in Nepal. So we have a similar registry in Pakistan as well, which was uh, set up late in 2017. And uh, now um, in, in a span of few years, uh, the registry has grown up. We have more than 70 intensive care uh, ICUs uh, from across the country on the registry and uh, comprising more than 1,000 beds. So because of this infrastructure in the region, during the pandemic, uh, uh, Crit Care Asia was able to respond. Uh, there is an organization known as ISARIC, which is um, International Severe Acute Respiratory and Emerging Infections Consortium. So ISARIC, in collaboration with WHO, uh, put out an R&D uh, clinical characterization protocol. 
so not only um, data was gen collected about covid patients from high income countries but uh, even uh, the south asian region has contributed more than uh, 9000 uh, patients uh, um, in intensive care units admitted with uh, COVID during the pandemic so far. So uh, our, the registry, the CCA is also contributing to another um, uh, global database known as uh, Logic. And uh, then uh, as the, uh, this remap cap was um, introduced, uh, uh, it was CCA and the contributing collaborating um, countries were able to set up uh, remap cap as well. So this is a big achievement as uh, Dip, uh, Diptesh has already told his story. I'm just going to uh, share a bit of my story of how this uh, international adaptive platform trial was introduced in Pakistan. So a, a big barrier to doing clinical trials uh, in uh, everywhere actually is uh, getting the uh, ethics approval. Especially during a pandemic, getting ethical approval becomes the biggest uh, barrier. So um, with the help of this registry data that we were already collecting, we applied for ethical approval and we uh, convinced the National Bioethics Committee that an expedited review needs to be done uh, in during the COVID pandemic. And luckily, our study was the first study that was um, uh, uh, appraised by the National Bioethics Committee. And when it uh, was time to um, uh, get ethical approval for remap cap, we got a very quick response. And uh, this um, biggest barrier was overcome very nicely. Then uh, the second step was to establish a research collaboration agreement between uh, the Monash University. Again, this was a new thing for the university that I work in. There were many questions, there were many apprehensions, but everything um, was sorted with patience, with support, collaboration. And now we have um, our uh, research collaboration agreements, not only between um, Zaudin and Monash, but uh, between Zaudin University where I work and five other sites within Pakistan. So as Diptesh has already told you that we utilize the existing uh, registry, which is operational in the in, in South Asian countries. So PRICE is the name of the Pakistan Registry of Intensive Care and um, the remap cap uh, data collection CRFs were embedded within this registry. The advantage was that because it was not a new platform, there was already a team of data collectors that was trained in collecting data. So in an intensive care unit, the, if somebody is familiar with the variables, it is not difficult to collect um, uh, data for a particular trial. So uh, already trained people started collecting uh, data for remap using the same platform. Uh, then if you approach the patients and tell them that you are doing some, um, some false study, obviously they are a bit apprehensive. So the process of informed consent was also a hurdle for us. So the consent forms were uh, adapted to the local languages and um, they were given um, as much local um, uh, adaptation as we could so that um, it does not look like that we are uh, importing something uh, from abroad. So we had collaboration, but it was very much a local a trial that was doing. Uh, procuring um, medicines, especially medicines which are not available in the countries, uh, also becomes a challenge. Vitamin C is a very commonly used uh, medicine, but the intravenous formulation was uh, not readily available. Uh, initially, we pro procured the medicine which was imported from Germany and then Turkey, but it was very expensive and the supply was very erratic. Uh, then luckily a local uh, pharmaceutical company started formulating uh, the vitamin C and since then we have had um, very little problem uh, with the supply chain. So Ziaudin University has three campuses and the trial was introduced in two of those campuses, uh, but we wanted to expand and in, enroll other sites. So meeting regularly with clinicians who were 
trained and aware of the importance of research, especially trying to find out uh, therapies that might help patients, uh, and also finding evidence to avoid therapies that might harm the patients. Because in countries like ours, um, where the regulations are not very strict, availability of medicines is um, is usually not a problem. The access of medicine to pay. So every patient then wants uh, any medicine that has been mentioned to be used in, the, in their treatment. So uh, both ways, finding therapies that work and also finding evidence for therapies that do not work um, in COVID was very important. So a uh, few of the hospitals that were receiving the highest number of COVID patients became part of uh, remap cap. Uh, Diptesh has already told you in detail how uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the training and the administration for remap cap uh, worked. So we have very strict um, clinical monitoring plan, uh, which uh, is implemented by the international trials team and then the regional management committee, and then it goes down to the uh, site level. So everybody makes sure that the data collected is of good quality. So, so far in Pakistan, we have five sites and we have uh, enrolled 450 patients in various uh, domains. And ivermectin um, happens to be uh, the domain um, where only Pakistan has, has started enrolling patients. So uh, after this, um, after nearly uh, more than a year of being part of remap cap, um, the experience gained is uh, huge. So the, uh, the, the lessons learned uh, maybe are to invest in research infrastructure where the burden of disease is. As everybody is aware, most of research that uh, comes out is in high income countries and many a times it is not applicable uh, to uh, low middle income countries where the burden of disease is. So uh, my request uh, to the JICA team and anybody else listening to this webinar is that they need to invest in research infrastructure in, in, in countries and regions um, where the burden of disease is. And uh, developing uh, col collaborations is also very important. And these collaborations cannot be made during an emergency situation, a disaster, or a pandemic. So existing collaborations, uh, when things are quiet, uh, are very important. So um, Pakistan is, is, is a small country, not, not in population, but otherwise it's a small country, but developing collaborations with CCAA and Zarek and the REMAP team, it really helped uh, us uh, being part of this international trial. The other thing I would suggest is uh, local engage engagement of clinicians. As I've told you that the number of um, clinicians who are trained in critical care is very, very limited. So we have to develop opportunities, uh, not only in terms of um, programs like master's programs, PhD programs, fellowships, to um, incentivize, to encourage um, uh, doctors and physicians uh, who are uh, only involved in clinical work to see uh, value in uh, research as well. And last but not the least, um, efforts at individual uh, level are obviously bearing fruit, uh, but uh, we need to involve um, ministries and national health systems and WHO because um, unless uh, such activities are validated and uh, there is a buy-in uh, from um, higher authorities, um, it usually is not sustainable. So this is just my limited experience that I have gained uh, doing uh, remap gap uh, uh, through the platform of CCA. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Madiha, for your presentation to share with us the Pakistan experience and as well as the, some recommendations to JICA. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much for our speakers for, the, for, for your presentations. Now, uh, we'll move on the QA session. Uh, thank you very much for many questions. 
through QA function, as well as the one we received prior to the webinar. So now I'd like to invite Dr. Isono, who is a JICA senior advisor in health, to moderate the QA session. Okay, Dr. Isono will pick up some, pick up and summarize your questions and ask the speakers on our behalf. So please note that we may not be able to ask all of your questions due to limited time, but uh, we, like, we try to uh, take up as much as possible until time allows. Okay, so Dr. Isono, so please take the floor for the QA session. Uh, thank you very much and good, good evening everybody and thank you very much for your very active participation to this webinar and uh, we already received so many questions so uh, I'd like to pick up some, some of uh, <clears throat> them and at first I'd like to say uh, thank, thanks so much for all three doctors, Dr. Saito, Diptish and Madiha for your excellent presentation. I think we, uh, your explanation is, is very fine to understand for everybody. So uh, at first I'd like to have uh, some questions on the uh, general profile or procedure for the remap cap. So uh, uh, these are the question to Dr. Saito. Uh, what is the procedure to participate in this remap cap? So if some, somebody or some hospitals wants to join to this remap cap, so to where should they apply? And the, are there any criteria to apply? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, the first of all, uh, uh, so it depends on the country, whether the country partic uh, participates in remap cap or not, because remap cap is supposed to have a regional management committee, meaning one country or one region should have a, like a body of organization. So like remap cap uh, in Japan has uh, the office for remap cap Japan. So, uh, so each country participating in remap cap should have such a body. So if you, uh, your country uh, has already uh, participated in, in remap cap, I would suggest uh, you could uh, approach uh, such a, a regional uh, management committee. If the country hasn't uh, uh, participated in remap cap, I, I, I think we can definitely uh, talk uh, personally, I guess, uh, but uh, uh, we are actually uh, uh, trying to explore what we can do after this webinar with JICA. Over. Uh, you mentioned that the remote cap should be applied by country, not by a hospital. So what kind of institution or organization can be the body for the application to represent the countries? Oh, no, each facility uh, can participate in remap cap. What I mean is that uh, remap cap uh, by, can I say, like a organization structure, we are supposed to have uh, each country participating in remap cap is supposed to have, there is, there is supposed to be a one regional management committee organized by local uh, expertise. Uh, so, uh, so we can approach uh, those people uh, representing each country. Uh, so I, I'm just, I'm very sorry, but so one hospital can apply to remap cap. So then after receiving the application, you will manage this kind of platform in each country. Is this right? Yes, uh, so let, let me just, just be very simple. For example, in Japan, uh, we uh, discussed with uh, one of the ITSC members, International Trial Steering Committee members, uh, uh, once the pandemic, uh, you know, happened. And then uh, we decided to participate in this remap cap community. And then we organized uh, remap cap uh, Japan regional management committee by ourselves. Then now we are trying to accept all the inquiries from any Japanese uh, facilities within Japan. So the same idea applies to other countries as well. 
So uh, even one hospital can participate in remap care, but uh, uh, but technically uh, that country uh, is to uh, formulate a team of remap cap members uh, within that country. I don't know if I answered your questions properly. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much. So uh, there is a, some question uh, because uh, I think there is only a few countries from Africa uh, participated in the map cap. So is there any obligation or restriction? So I think every country can apply from, yes. from Africa. So, yes, technically, yes. So like uh, deputation that Mariha mentioned, they're working under critical care Asia and Africa. So they're uh, trying to reach other countries, including African countries. So I think they can answer uh, more properly. I don't know, Mariha or deputation, if you have any additional comments. Yeah, so I what I understand is, uh, so critical care Asia and Africa uh, is a regional, uh, manage, uh, managing coordination uh, committee for this reason. So all the remap sites in Nepal or India or Pakistan are being coordinated through CCA. So I think um, the same <clears throat> uh, can be done through CCA Africa for African countries, but that's just my opinion. I think uh, there are other people in the committee who can uh, discuss and um, get back to this question in detail later on. Uh, okay, thank you very much for uh, so any every country can participate to uh, this remark cap. So that, that is very fine. So uh, ne next question is. What, what, if one country or hospital applied to the remark cap, uh, where does budget come from? Thank you very much. So it's also again depends on the countries you, you, you where you are. Uh, so for example, Japan, we have to uh, find we had to find our uh, own funds by ourselves within Japan. And then definitely we can, you know, uh, communicate uh, with other partners for potential, uh, you know, collaboration, and then yeah, it, it uh, again depends. So uh, each country or hospital should find the budget source by their own. Ideally, yes, but uh, we can definitely discuss internally, and and then you know because we our group is a global team, so we can definitely discuss with other members as well. Okay, thank you very much. So how about the cases in Pakistan and Nepal? Uh, did you provide the uh, necessary budget by your own or, you, or you, you could get some funding resources? Yes, um, in, in Pakistan, uh, how we started was uh, because the uh, Pakistan Registry of Intensive Care is already a funded project. So most of the funding initially uh, came through CCA, the Welcome Trust Grant that is funding the registries. So uh, setting up a registry, having a, a running registry means that a team of data collectors, a team of uh, a few research assistants, they are already uh, part of the system. So uh, once uh, for medicine, obviously there are different medicines, few are very expensive, few are very cheap. So initial funding was through uh, the CCA. Uh, then the remap uh, cap uh, also uh, gives you a per uh, a patient uh, included in the trial compensation. It is not much, it is around $75. Uh, I'm not sure if it is across the board or is it only for um, the uh, Pakistan and Nepal and countries like that, but a little fund is provided um, uh, for the per patient that uh, that is enrolled in the trial. Okay, thank you very much. How, how about Nepal? I think it, it's the same. Yeah, we follow the same module. So we have support for the registry. And since registry uh, is integrated with REMAP and, uh, and this, uh, the REMAP uh, in this part of the region is uh, the primary funder is from the Monash University. So we have support from CCA and Monash University both. 
Okay, uh, th thank you very much. So uh, uh, next question is, uh, how about the training? So maybe uh, some hospital or country needs training to understand what is a APT and uh, uh, training for um, providing the quality intervention. So who will provide the training to uh, participate in hospitals? Thank you very much. So uh, let me start uh, from my side. Uh, for example, in Japan, we uh, essentially communicated with the team from uh, ITSC members uh, who provided us with the training materials like online video and then online uh, like meetings. After such uh, meetings and training opportunities, uh, we were able to start uh, locally as well. And then uh, I think uh, it's a prime time for Japan asked to think about such opportunities as well so that we can hopefully you know support uh, other uh, people as well uh, but uh, yeah Mariha and then Diptish uh, can you share your stories so training obviously it's a complex trial and uh, unless uh, each and every uh, aspect is understood by the people entering data it's not going to be successful so we are again very very lucky that uh, cca engaged a dedicated um, uh, people who were supporting uh, who were themselves part of the itc so they got training and then they uh, passed it on so each and every site that is enrolled in cca they have to undergo constant uh, training and monitoring so we have weekly meetings uh, with the cca uh, team uh, data from each and every site it is scrutinized and it made sure that it is um, of uh, the highest uh, standard so trainings are ongoing. The training starts from data collectors to the people who um, enter it in the in the registries. Then there are uh, people who monitor, who uh, screening the informed consent. So it's a constant ongoing process, um, uh, which is in in our region. It is supported through uh, CCA. Thank you. So how about Nepal? Can you share your yeah, so uh, we have uh, built uh, site-specific coordinators. Uh, we have national coordinator, and they, they coordinate with a regional coordinator of remap cap. And uh, we have a set of uh, <coughs> training materials, um, uh, which um, um, they have to uh, complete compulsorily before the site is enrolled. So we have a set uh, structure and uh, material for the training. Uh, which is um, basically coordinated through CCA. And, and, and there's major roles and responsibilities of the national coordinators as well. Okay, thank you very much. So for the uh, national coordinator, I think uh, uh, if there is a uh, platform like CCA, I think it's, it's a bit easy to recruit or to uh, hire the national coordinator. But the, if there is no such kind of the platform uh, in uh, countries, uh, how can you recruit or how can you employ the national coordinator? I think it, that's a great question. What I can say is that uh, as I presented uh, in my slides, essentially, uh, this kind of adaptive part of trial, it's not a, like a simple trial. And then this uh, requires long-term commitment and strong commitment from uh, participants as well. So I think this is like a long process of a human development uh, where maybe Jaiker is uh, more familiar, <laughs> uh, better than I do. But uh, actually this is not like a short-term uh, research project. This is like a uh, long-term uh, large global like a networking project where we need a lot of commitment, uh, you know, from locally and globally. And then definitely we have to somehow uh, liaise uh, between uh, such local and global networks. Okay, uh, th thank you very much. So uh, next question is uh, regarding the uh, intervention. So uh, how can you select the intervention to each country? So I think there's a 
many kinds of the uh, intervention like medicine A, medicine B, or medicine C. So how can you select uh, intervention in your own country? Is there any rule? Dr. Shimadeha, maybe you can answer better than I do. Yeah, so, uh, so let me explain. Uh, okay, go ahead, Madhya. No, it's, uh, it's just that it's, um, it's a very important question because remap cap is uh, there are many domains and so how do we how did we select what we wanted to do so again um, i think first cca it, it selected a few domains and then it offered all the domains to the collaborating so from my point of view it was important that the medicine is first of all available so there are many medicines, uh, therapies uh, being explored that are not available in the country. So obviously, it, this was my first time doing the clinical trial. So I did not want to get involved in procuring the medicine. So we initially selected vitamin C, anticoagulation, antiplatelets, statins and ivermectin. So these are the medicines that are available. Then you have to keep in mind the cost as well, because um, obviously our uh, infrastructure is being um, looked after through the registry uh, fund, but uh, if the medicine is very costly, obviously we cannot afford that. Then our own interest as well, because uh, I, I selected ivermectin because uh, it was very, very relevant to Pakistan. All the GPs were using ivermectin without having any evidence. The evidence that was coming out was conflicting. One paper saying use it, other paper saying do not use it. So it has to be your personal relevance as well, because I, I didn't want to choose a therapy which was not relevant to my situation. So availability is important, um, access is important, relevance is very important to therapies that are of use to our um, settings. So I think uh, these are uh, the, the few things that we kept in mind while selecting what we wanted to do. Then in the end, it was also the ease of screening process because we did get ethical approval for anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapies, but the clinician on site were very, very apprehensive in using initially the high dose anticoagulation. So we did have ethical approval. We did introduce it in our ICUs, but the clinicians, they did not take up. So it's again has to be the buy-in from the clinicians as well. So in the end, our highest enrollment uh, was in um, vitamin C, ivermectin, and uh, statins. So these are the things that we kept in mind. Over to Diptesh. He wants to add anything out they chose there. Uh, no i agree with what uh, madhya has said so i don't have anything to add it's, the, it's almost uh, the same process everywhere yeah th thank you very much so uh can a participant uh, propose new intervention or it's just uh, already uh, set yeah, so uh, it's been discussed uh, at the different levels, uh, but uh, uh, most of the time, so uh, some already conduct uh, like uh, uh, smaller studies at the local level, and then uh, they actually uh, suggested to the global level for potential interventions. And at the global level, we have a meeting regularly or even have a, like a smaller group of members who uh, decide which intervention needs to be prioritized, et cetera. So they can be uh, uh, determined at the global level at the end. Okay, thank you very much. So I, uh, <clears throat> judging from the ex uh, explanation by Dr. Mariha, I think uh, uh, within the country, each hospital can select interventions. Is that right? No, each hospital intervention uh, the in, uh, because it's a, a whole uh, process because you need to do literature search. You have to make sure that there is uh, feasibility for doing such. So uh, as a national coordinator, I applied for ethical approval for the five domains that I thought were feasible in our, uh, in our country. But again, then each individual site also had their own 
um, own uh, concerns. For example, one of our collaborating hospital is National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases. So uh, they could not take up statin because uh, most of their patients are already on statin. So again, each site then has their own um, buy-in of what they want to do. So they did not do anticoagulation, antiplatelets, or statin because they're mostly cardiac patients were already on that. Okay, thank you very much. So um, I think uh, uh, in Pakistan and uh, um, Nepal, both countries are based on the CCAA. So that that means the uh, ICU or critical care unit are the center of the, this uh, uh, project. So that, that means uh, uh, most, mostly the patient in the severe cases. Is that right? So then uh, how can you try uh, provide a clinical trial for mild or moderate cases uh, outside the ICU? You could involve the, or the hospital. So that's how where we need uh, more resources uh, to develop more. So this is just a pilot project because the registry was already in place, and it is uh, it it is it is it was expanded to before ICU as well because in COVID uh, patients they were mostly admitted to isolation wards. So again, a very well defined area. So we did expand the registry out of intensive care unit to the isolation wards where um, a moderate, uh, a moderately severe COVID patients were admitted. Uh, but obviously the main, the highest number are from ICUs where the registries are already established. So we have to uh, build more, you know, we need more resources, more infrastructures. And as the uh, uh, registry expands to all areas, then it will be easy to do trials. So this is just like a snapshot that this can be done if basic infrastructure is there, you can scale it up in need in a pandemic, epidemic, disaster, it can be scaled up. But if nothing exists, then obviously you can't do anything. So the next step is to have this registry go outside ICU as well, where uh, to, to emergency units, for example. Uh, so because my area of interest is intensive care, so I have put my resources to develop, to set up this registry in intensive care. But if there is a clinician who wants to invest time or somebody wants to invest in that clinician in an emergency department, that, that's another place where registries are needed, trauma registries are needed, um, uh, uh, other registries are needed. So it is really basically where uh, uh, money is invested. Uh, thank you very much. So how, how about Nepal? So until now, uh, the remap, the eligible patients are from ICU only. And uh, so all the patients who are admitted in ICU, either moderate or severely ill patients, they get they are eligible for <coughs> remap enrollment. So we haven't started a remap cap outside ICU, but there are um, opportunities and possibilities to expand to non-critical areas as well, as Madhya said. Uh, so it depends upon our own need and whether we want to expand the, because this has a this adaptive design with multiple domains, multiple interventions, and then um, this can be expanded. There's an opportunity, but uh, that needs further planning and uh, discussion. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, next question is posed to Nepal and Pakistan. So. What are the advantages for you to participate in this kind of clinical trial, uh, remap cap? Uh, you mentioned that you developed the research capacity uh, by uh, participating in this uh, um, clinical trial. So what are the overall advantages for you to participate in this kind of uh, international clinical trials? Yeah, I think the most important is capacity building because as I said, there are a handful of clinicians in critical care and research output is very limited. So uh, doing learning by doing is the easiest way. Like I'm not a PhD, I'm a pure clinician. 
and I was not doing any research. But just by doing this clinical trial, I have learned so much. My team has learned so much. And within a span of a year, now we are getting uh, doctors, fresh graduates, who are showing interest in doing a full research uh, fellowship. So we have two doctors who, who, are, who have opted not to do residency in, 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 a, in a clinical specialty, but to do uh, their um, uh, a dedicated research job, so which, which is very exciting because I don't know anybody before this, uh, a doctor who was prepared to give up clinical work and work in research. It's very common in high income countries, in Western countries, but in, in our, it, it was not, uh, it is not very uh, common to uh, have doctors work in research capacity only. So building capacity is the single most important thing that has come out of it. And the other thing is that uh, we, we don't get answers to questions that are relevant to us, to LMICs, because, because they're not important. So high income countries, they do research, they get answers, they generate hypotheses, they get answers to questions that are very relevant to them. Sometimes those questions are not relevant to us at all. Our needs are very different. So our needs are maybe simpler even, which are not important to uh, very advanced uh, research thing. So in doing this, uh, I see, I can relate to it because these therapies, um, vitamin C, ivermectin, these are not expensive therapies. They are readily available in, in Pakistan. And I would get answers from my population because uh, the populations also differ. So maybe the research done in, in high income countries, they, the questions are relevant to them, the answers are relevant to them. But those answers, my population may not be answering those questions. So if in future we have more clinical trials in which the population is also ours, the drugs are also those that are relevant to us, obviously we'll be doing evidence-based medicine as well. So far, we just import the evidence and apply it on our population. Okay, thank you very much. For how about the Nepal? Yeah, I just like to add one more thing there. So, when we do, uh, when we participate in this kind of trials, like for example, Remap Cap, there was an anticoagulation domain, right? So we tested usual dose versus therapeutic anticoagulation. And uh, it was published in New England, uh, where it showed that in severely ill ICU patients, COVID patients, therapeutic anticoagulation didn't help. And uh, the, the physicians, the usual practice was to give therapeutic anticoagulation to all the patients. Uh, and after this publication, many uh, physicians locally has changed, like the, the, the findings of the research has been translated into the clinical practice. And that has helped us um, address the resource utilization and um, issue as well. And in, in settings like ours, when we do clinical trials, not only the trial itself, but the quality of care of uh, services that is provided in the hospitals, directly or indirectly get better because people, they tend to follow certain protocols and principles and that has helped us. And, and then we go on to identify other gaps which are relevant to our context. And then we can ourselves generate new hypotheses, new research projects to address our problems locally. So this has been some of the advantages of uh, participating in REMAP. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So you mentioned that the participating in this kind of research uh, <clears throat> can work to improve the research capacity, but also to work to improve the clinical practice uh, as well. Uh, I think it's it's a very good good. Uh, and how about the Pakistan? That's the same. Do you feel the same? Exactly the same. Documentation improves because there are many places where uh, a lot, there are a lot of gaps in documentation. But when you are doing implementing a clinical trial, then everybody is on their toes. Their baseline uh, documentation, record keeping, 
uh, improves and then eventually clinical care improves because uh, people become aware of what's going on uh, of making sure that gaps are not there for example ideal body weight was never uh, recorded in one of the files so once it was implemented then they started making sure that all the patients on their charts ideal body weight is mentioned so it definitely helps improve uh, care of uh, thank you very much. So the, the final question is uh, regarding the uh, data management. So I think uh, uh, in Pakistan and Nepal, uh, you, you have uh, some uh, uh, data registration system uh, by CCAA, and you could apply to this system to enter the data to the remap gap. So is there any other uh, possibility like uh, DHIS? Uh, Somebody can use the DHIS to <clears throat> enter the register the data to remap study. Dr. Saito, do you have any opinion? So we have a lot of different uh, teams within the remap gap at the global level. And then there's a specific uh, team for uh, uh, CRF and data management as well. And then uh, we have also data coordinating center as well. And then definitely uh, different countries have a different uh, EDC systems, but uh, right now, uh, currently there are limited numbers of EDCs available uh, to remap gap, including the one uh, used by uh, CCAA. And definitely uh, we, as uh, remap cap uh, stands for, you know, embedded is a very important aspect. So if uh, you know one uh, country ha uses a, a different uh, EDC system, etc., definitely we have to think about embedding, and then you know we need to be pragmatic so that our network can uh, continue to grow up. So uh, definitely this is uh, you know needs to be uh, uh, taken into account. But yeah, right now we have a limited number of EDCs uh, at, at at this moment. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much uh, for all the uh, kind of quest, uh, answer to the, all the questions. So I think uh, uh, so this kind of research for clinical trial is very important uh, to fight with uh, COVID-19 or any other pandemics to uh, find the best practice or best treatment as soon as possible. So I think uh, uh, <clears throat> Um, everybody uh, who participates, uh, all participants uh, today uh, could understand the significance of this kind of clinical trial. And I hope uh, many participants uh, have interest in this kind of trials. If we have more number of the participants or more, more number of the countries, maybe we will get more uh, quality of uh, <coughs> results. Uh, as soon as possible. So anyway, thank you very much. And uh, we'd like to over this uh, <coughs> Q&A session. Thank you, Ito-san. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Isana, for moderating this uh, Q&A session and uh, give us uh, some uh, technical insight at the end. And thank you very much for, the, for everyone uh, for your engagement by asking a question to our speakers. Okay, so I think this comes to the end of today's webinar. And thank you very much, audience, for your participation. And thank you very much for distinguished speakers, for the presentations. Before we close, uh, I just give you a reminder. Uh, first of all, uh, please give us your feedback on today's event by responding to an online survey. So this will not take much of your time, just uh, five minutes. So your feedback is uh, highly appreciated. Second, uh, we will have the next webinar in November. So we will inform you its detail by emailing you and on our website. Okay, so we, we look forward to meeting you at the next webinar again. Until then, hoping you're staying well and thank you and good day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.